Reading from James chapter 1 today, and then um, I'm going to be thinking about various parts of the book of James. In some ways, it's excellent that this book is placed in the Bible reading plan that many of us follow right after the book of Romans, because those books complement each other very well. If you just read verses in isolation and ignore meanings, you'd say they contradict each other. Paul says we're justified by faith and not by works, and James says, you see that a man is not justified by faith alone, but by faith made complete in works. You say, well, come on, you know, these guys obviously are just contradicting each other, but um, they're, they're show, one is showing the necessity of faith and, and everything comes from God, and the other one is saying, hey, um, if nothing is changing in your life, don't try to tell yourself you've got the kind of faith that saves, because that, um, as some of the reformers put it, uh, we're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Um, it always brings something along with it. And so we're going to be looking today at um, listening to God's word and putting it into practice. James 1, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself, and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This ends the reading of God's word, and God always blesses his word to those who listen. In this church, we often ta um, use the phrase talking and listening repeatedly and sometimes say that um, a relationship is talking and listening repeatedly. But of course, it's not. Um, the, commun the verbal communication part of a relationship is talking and listening repeatedly. And the verbal communication part of a relationship is just one part of a much bigger relationship. If for five minutes a day, you give your spouse a kiss and say, I love you, honey, and then the rest of the time treat that spouse like dirt, you wouldn't really have a great relationship, even though you spend five minutes a day talking and doing that nice little thing. Um, right. You know, that you have to have more than just talking and listening repeatedly. Um, you shouldn't have less than that. <laughs> you, need, you do need to talk. You do need to listen. You need the verbal communication part of a relationship, but there's more to it than just that. And so when we um, listen to God's word in James, we learn about active listening. Now, sometimes the psychologists and so on have techniques of active listening where you learn to really pay attention and to um, kind of get people to say what's on their heart and so on. What I mean by active listening can certainly involve um, paying careful attention, but it's putting what you hear into action. That's active listening. Now, when we... When we look at um, the importance of listening, God himself says over and over again in the Bible, I'm just quoting one verse here, listen to me, hear me, that your soul may live. As Moses put it, these words that you're being given today aren't just words, they're your life. Listen as though your life depends on it, because it does. Listen to me, says God, that your soul may live. James says, be quick to listen. And certainly the one we need to be quickest to listen to is God himself. And oftentimes, of course, God speaks supremely through his word, but he also comes to us through other people, through words of encouragement, through words of warning, um, just through testing each other and, and building each other up in our understanding. And so, again, the book of Proverbs, the way of a fool seems right to him. What does he need advice for? Um, he's already got it all figured out. But a wise man listens to advice. He listens to other people. Um, you know, it says in the Bible, a, a fool, a sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer discreetly. You know, 
Um, it, old Mr. Lazy Bones is smarter than seven PhDs. Um, he's just a genius. Um, and so this comes up as, as you read the book of Proverbs once a week. You hear this over and over again. And these guys, the one characteristic of a fool is he's always yapping. And another one is he's never listening. Um, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak is the opposite of what the fool is up to. So quick to listen both to other people and to God, a relationship to God it means you listen to him, you want to know what, it's, what is on his mind and on his heart, and then you want to respond to it um, by your own words of prayer, but also by your actions. And the same is true in relationships with other people. You listen, and you take to heart what you're hearing, and then you do it. Slow to speak. Do you see a man who speaks in haste? There's more hope for a fool than for him. And there's a gazillion other... Um, Verses like that in Proverbs, you know, you know the old saying, better to keep your mouth shut and have people think you're a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. Um, <laughs> do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Now, I was quizzing my kids on the way to church today because I knew that I had told a story in church before and I wanted to see if they remembered it. And some did and some didn't. So I don't know if we'll learn out what kind of listeners you are or just whether you happen to be in church when I told the story before. But here's, here's the story. Um, the guy... A guy was driving on a very curvy mountain road, and it was a very narrow one. And he saw, uh, coming around the corner was somebody coming from the opposite direction. Since the road was so narrow, he pulled over to the side to let the person pass. And as that person went past, she leaned out the window and yelled, Pig! Oh, that was quite an insult for this guy. He was peeved because he'd been very polite, pulled over, and she'd called him a pig. So he slammed his car in gear and hit the gas and roared around the corner and smashed into the pig she'd warned him about. <laughs> now, that's um, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7. You know, you, you blow your stack, you lose your temper, you're really furious. Maybe they weren't trying to insult you. <laughs> Maybe they were trying to help you and warn you. And again, we're reading each week a chapter from the book of Proverbs, and Proverbs is constantly saying, boy, if you want to get smart, listen to those rebukers out there, uh, you know, or those people who are giving you warnings. And, and the main danger there is that we're too quick to react. You know, it, it just hits a nerve and we get furious. It, it, in a sermon, too, be really careful. When you hear a sermon that gets you really, really hot, that's the one you really got to sit back and take a deep breath and say, now, am I hot because he was a heretic? or because he was a moron, or did he hit me uh, right where um, I needed to be hit? And maybe the he was not the preacher. There are higher authorities involved in these things. Um, and so we need to be aware that sometimes the things that upset us or rile us may be right where the Holy Spirit is probing into our life. And so be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because as James says, anger doesn't bring about the righteous life that God desires. Um, that when your temperature goes up, um, your IQ goes down. This is one of the fundamental laws of life. Um, yeah, there are times for righteous indignation, but most of the time, the madder you get, the slower your brain is working. Now, the, if you're quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, and then it says, get rid of all moral filth. Don't just be a baseball farmer either. Um, you know, I, I guess most of us are baseball farmers also in, try, in seeking to walk with God. We have a lots, uh, lots of misses and not so many hits. But here it says, prepare that soil, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, says James, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Now, James was the half-brother of our Lord Jesus, and James uh, no doubt knew of Jesus' teaching on these matters of farming. And Jesus' famous story of the, of the four soils, where one soil is just very hard and in many ways stands for the very busy, 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 um, hardened heart where the word of God comes and it just sits there, doesn't even sink in at all, and Satan just comes in and sweeps it away before it even gets started. Others have very shallow soil. They've never dug down deep. Um, they're always living on the surface, and they hear the word, oh, it's wonderful, I just love it, and then... Um, a few weeks later, a little bit of trouble comes along and everything withers up and, and so on because it was shallow soil. That rocks right underneath that nice, um, that nice fertile surface that was an eighth of an inch deep. Um, you know, it was solid rock under there or at least lots of, uh, lots of rocks. And I, I grew up on a farm. When you got rock bars, 
you got to get rid of the rocks or they dry up every year as soon as the sun comes, you know, as soon as it gets hot for a little while. Um, that soil that's got tons of rocks in it doesn't grow much. And then, of course, there's the weedy stuff. And Jesus says this is um, the pleasures of this world as well as the cares. You know, not just the problems, but the pleasures. All that stuff that you're having fun with can get you so preoccupied that you just don't have time for the Word of God. Being quick to listen is harder than ever in our time. Uh, Pascal, the, the great Christian thinker as well as a great scientist, said that the, the main problem with the world is that a man can't sit quietly in his room. You know, that, which is kind of a funny saying when, when he says, but he, back in his day he said, you know, the, there are some people that they're always wanting to play tennis or badminton. You know, this was in the 1600s. Um, or... They, you know, they're always, some of them are doing these frivolous things to keep them occupied. Others turn to algebra or start wars to keep themselves interested if they're heads of state. The one thing they can't just sit there and do is think about the state of their own life and listen to what God is saying to them. And so this great need to prepare the soil. Jesus says that the, those with a noble and good heart are the ones who receive the word and produce that, that crop that's a hundredfold. And a, and a noble and good heart just doesn't come automatically. That deep soil is prepared by getting rocks out of there, by weeds being uprooted, and God needs to prepare that soil in our hearts. Um, the prophet Jeremiah said, you know, plow your hearts. Um, get rid of the thorns and thistles. And then something can grow. So uh, if you want to have active listening, you have to realize that your intellect is often shaped by your actions. Jesus once said, men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And the thing that kept them from believing intellectually was because they were doing stuff that interfered with their ability to hear and their willingness to accept. We sometimes think that the brain leads the will, but sometimes the will and the actions lead the brain. And so part of preparing is to realize there's a ton of stuff in my life that God needs to root out, and I can't even get my thinking straight unless a lot of those sins are rooted out. Um, sin will cause you to think badly. It doesn't just cause you to act badly. It twists the way you think after a while. And so preparing for the Word of God um, in, involves the cleaning up, a lot of cleaning up in one's life. Um, and sometimes the cleanup comes after you've received the word. Sometimes certain elements of cleaning up come before you fully understand what the word is saying. Now, dead orthodoxy. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. You see that phrase several times in James. Don't deceive yourselves. Don't trick yourselves. And for religious people or people who go through certain rituals or who read the Bible, self-deception is a tricky thing. Um, you may be talking and listening repeatedly and not doing anything. Um, don't just listen to the world and, word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And then it talks about deadness in James 2. And that passage runs from verse 14 through verse 26. I'm just highlighting the first and the last verses of it. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. I sometimes compare sound doctrine to a skeleton. Now, skeletons are excellent things. I like to have one. Um, you know, I'm not a jellyfish. Uh, a skeleton is an outstanding thing to have. But you can have a skeleton without life. Humans can't have much of a life without a skeleton. Uh, we do need sound doctrines, good beliefs that give shape to the life that we have in Christ. But it is possible to be a skeleton and be deader than a stone. And so we need to understand what James is saying, that we can't just be skeletons who have correct doctrines, you know, the right bones in the right places. Um, those bones have to be clothed with life and flesh and action in the Lord. So one way that he says, don't deceive yourselves, he reminds us that, that beliefs can be dead if they're not accompanied by action. In fact, beliefs can be demonic. You believe there's one God? Well, good for you. So do the demons. And they at least have the sense to shudder. Instead of strutting around saying, I believe, I believe. Well, of course they believe. You know, Satan's had a better theological education than any of you. He's had a better theological education than I have. You know, he spent time in the heaven of heavens. He knows more about 
uh, the Almighty and looks at it from the wrong angle, but nonetheless knows more than any of us or all of us put together, and his demons are very knowledgeable. When Jesus showed up, they did not have debates with liberal theologians about whether he was the Son of God or not. Um, they knew, and they scared the daylights out of them. Um, we know who you are. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't like who he was. And so you can have a, a demonic faith that, that has um, correct ideas about who's the big boss of the universe and who, who came to earth um, in human flesh and, and know that Jesus is God and still be lost because your attitudes and actions are in utter contrast and rebellion to the Lord. And then you have a faith that's um, quite a bit like demons, except you might not yet be smart enough or knowledgeable enough to tremble about it. So we want to beware of, beware of dead orthodoxy and demonic orthodoxy, and that's a, one of the great values of the book of James, is it gives you these tests so that you're not always tricking yourself and fooling yourself into believing that you are what you're not. Now what's a mirror for? Anyone who looks at the word but does not do what it says is like a guy who looks in a mirror and then forgets what he saw. Now, little kids sometimes like looking in a mirror just because they like looking in a mirror. And some big kids, too. Uh, oh, you handsome beast, you. And so, you know, when I get up in the morning, I must confess that's not my first thought. It's a horrifying sight. Um, you may think it's still a horrifying sight, but it's even worse that, you know, when the day starts, when, you know, before you shave, before you comb your hair, before you get all cleaned up. Now, you go look in the mirror, and you think the only purpose of looking in the mirror was to take a gander in the mirror and then head out. That is just stupid. The only, the only reason mirrors exist is to show you what you look like so you can straighten up what isn't the way it's supposed to be. And this is the purpose of God's Word. It's not there just to say, we read the Bible and that was nice. Um, it's to look into that Bible and keep looking into that perfect law that gives freedom and putting it into practice and changing what needs changing. Um, to go back to that other comparison I also used of sometimes your own deeds can get in the way of, of hearing and understanding properly. Think again of a mirror. Sometimes when you take a shower and the, and the mirror's in the, in the same room, um, you get out and you can go look in that mirror, but what do you see? Fog, uh, because you fogged up the mirror. The mirror's plumb fine, but you fogged it, and now it's gonna take a while, and you're not gonna see it till the fog is gone. And this is the way that, that it is in our life, too. Sometimes our actions and our attitudes just fog up the mirror, and we, the mirror is fine, God's word is fine, but we just can't take to heart what it's saying because our own attitudes and actions are getting in the way. And so James says, don't be fooling yourself here. If you go to God's word eager to find out what's wrong with yourself, eager to find out how God wants to keep transforming you, eager to be encouraged in his way, well then, um, you're going to be blessed in what you do. Once you understand what the mirror's for and use it that way, uh, then finally you'll have some active listening going on. Now, again, in the, in the area of testing yourselves, this, this theme that comes up over and over in James. If anyone considers himself religious and doesn't keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself, that phrase again, and his religion is worthless. <laughs> That's not exactly a big compliment, is it? Um, then you read, many of you have read that passage in chapter 3. The tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Now that's not the kind of thing that we would normally say, is it? You know, even in a good many evangelical churches, for example, there's much more focus on a different part of the body that is the main problem. And people think that sexual desire is the main thing that everybody is, leads people into evil. Well, it is one possibility, but not the most frequently mentioned in the Bible. It, it's certainly one to be aware of. But your mouth, um, how you talk to people, what you say about people can be just as serious or even more serious as the kind of physical sins that people sometimes commit. And so we need to be very aware of what the mouth can do. Jesus says, by your words, you'll be acquitted, you know, you'll be declared innocent, or by your words, you'll be condemned. One of the chief evidences on the day of judgment is the kind of words you used. That's a theme all through the Bible, sure is in James. And so we need to be very wary of the damage the tongue can do, as well as the blessing 
that it can give. Again, if there's one book of the New Testament that's a lot like Proverbs, it's James. Um, that same style of, of proverbial wisdom, of sayings, and also of the themes. When you read Proverbs, it says again and again that the tongue does such and such evil, or you know, from a righteous man his lips bring blessing, and they're like apples of gold and settings of silver, and you know, all that nice fancy language about what wonderful things words can do when they're used rightly. Words are a great blessing and a great power. And that's why it's such a great evil when you can misuse that power. The best things in the world are the worst when they go bad. The greatest of the archangels is the most evil of all beings because he had the greatest talent, the greatest abilities, um, the most splendor. So when Satan fell, he got worse than everything else. The tongue, the, the gift of language is such a stupendous blessing. Um, it's built on the Word himself. In the beginning was the Word, um, Jesus Christ. What a gift the Word is. And when the words that we have fall, they are set on fire by hell. Um, we're, you know, there's lots of things we can go wrong with, but words is one of the biggest because we can do so much good or so much harm with them. A um, couple of examples that James gives. One is, oh, you know, you were singing in parts on Sunday and you were, um, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And then you were calling your brother, you idiot, or calling your sister this or that, and you're cursing your people that you know. Well, um, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. I don't think that's the way it should be. And it's not just how you speak of, of God, but also sometimes we use language to get people to take us more seriously. And James says, don't swear. Certainly not by God's name. Don't swear by anything on earth or in heaven. Just be the kind of person when you say yes, you mean yes. When you say no, you mean no. And if you live that way and talk that way, people will know that you say what you mean and that you mean what you say and you don't have to pile on all kinds of cursing and swearing and all other sorts of things to get people to take you seriously. If you're a person of your word, if your yes is yes, your no, no, of course this is just Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, same deal. James is quoting um, his brother. Uh, you need to say what you mean, mean what you say, watch your tongue. Again, these are, these are the tests of whether it's real religion or not. Um, are you controlling the way you talk? Another of the tests that James gives is this. Um, religion that God likes is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. In a sense, the Bible just has it right in a nutshell right there, and it diagnoses exactly what goes wrong in many churches in the modern world. Many churches in the modern world want to have it one way or the other. They either want to have a social conscience and be kind to the poor and look out for the needy, and then, of course, uh, in personal morality and worldliness and so on, oh, that stuff doesn't matter at all. And some of the more conservative and evangelical churches are very... Um, attentive to issues of individual morality and of sexual purity and the like, perhaps. But um, ah, those namby-pamby liberals, they're, they're, they're the ones that are always worrying about the poor. Uh, so you, you sometimes divide what God keeps together, and James gives a double test. He says, hey, they care about people in need, and they aren't compromising with, with worldliness and wickedness. Okay, I don't like it, you know that. Um, I've said it a time or two, and I'll just say it again today, because almost any passage of the Bible you preach on gives you one more chance to slam the prosperity gospel. Um, you know, you can't hardly pick a place in the Bible that doesn't. Uh, but anyway, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You know, that's the opening line. You know, after he says, hi, I'm James, it's consider it joy when you suffer. I think we're not in prosperity gospel territory here. Um, you, you know, we're already into suffering by verse 2. And... And then he goes on to say, okay, you guys that are prosperous, you should really take pride in your low position because you know what? I've got good news for you. All that prosperity is going to go, and your health is going to go, and you're going to die, and all your riches are going to vanish. You can't take any of it with you. Isn't that good news? You know, you rich guys should take pride in your low position, and you guys that are poor, you know what? Um, you should be happy about that high position you've got. Um, so, yeah, the, these preachers with um, a couple of, Mercedes and a few of spare Porsches tucked away um, should take pride in their low position. Uh, 
My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. And then he goes on to say, you know, when the fat cats and the rich guys come in, you say, oh, and, and you treat them because, you know, we know the donors and we know the important people who can really make things go and who have the clout. And so we've got to treat the rich people well. And so you elbow aside the kind of poor guy who was sitting up in the best seat and you say, hey, you get over there. A rich guy just showed up. Um, and James says, this is not how... Jesus taught us. Jesus said that we don't do what the world does. When, when you say keeping yourself unspotted from the world, part of it is not following the world's values, that the rich people are the ones that matter most, that the ones with the big titles are the ones that count. Um, God chose those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. And you've insulted the poor. Isn't it the rich who are exploiting you? You know, it's the rich who are foreclosing on you. It's the rich who are hunting you down. The rich are doing you lots of damage, and here you are toadying up to them. You know, why don't you get a life? That, that's what James is saying. It, it is so common to always be trying to get in good with somebody who's important and to neglect those who are less important. And if you have God's priorities, um, the poorest, uh, least influential person you run into counts in God's eyes just as much or more than the latest hot shot or billionaire. And so, once again, not a good case for the prosperity gospel. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Instead of being told, you know, whatever desire you have, name it and claim it and God will give it to you. Ask whether your desire is right in the first place. If your desire stinks, then get that desire changed. Because it's when you're chasing all this stuff that you want that God doesn't want you to have that you get into fights and that you get into quarrels. And when you ask God, you don't get it because you ask with wrong motives so that you can spend it on your pleasures. If you ask God for something, why do you want it? If you want it for your own pleasures and just for me, myself, and I, then don't be shocked if you don't get it. Oh, by the way, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? You read the book of Ezekiel, God tells of, of taking Israel and finding her as a baby, laying there in her own blood and abandoned, and he takes that baby and feeds it and raises it up, and it grows up to be beautiful and makes that beautiful woman his queen. And then she goes off after all of that, abandons this person who saved her and made her beautiful and married her and made her wealthy, and she runs off with all kinds of, of other lovers than the one who saved her and truly loved her. And that's the symptom here. You adulterous people, do you love money more than you love God? Do you, do you gotta have stuff and God is just the button you push to get the stuff you want? Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you. And I, I'm actually cutting short what James has to say <laughs> on, on these matters, um, but he has a lot to say. And it, it's very, um, alarming in many ways when you live in the richest country in the world and when it's just taken for granted that the pursuit of wealth is one of the highest values that there is. If wealth is given to us at all, it is for other purposes than just our own pleasures. And James reminds us of that repeatedly. Now, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If any of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So, again, um, real religion cares about orphans and widows in their distress, cares about people who are the lost and the last and the least and need a hand up, um, and don't just talk about it. L search and look for people to whom you can be a blessing and, and then bless them. And this is the test of true religion. Um, it's not just, did I have devotions? Um, that other kind, your life of action will dry up without a walk with God and without a daily um, feeding on his word and times in prayer with him. You'll, you'll get tired and you'll wear out and you can't keep it up. Um, and it is a case that, um, that in our society too. Those who start out with a more liberal religion that ignores the deity of Christ and the need for salvation but emphasize social action, they end up actually giving less money to the needy um, and, do, and spending less time volunteering. I mean, the, this isn't my opinion. This is big shots in social research 
find that those who talk very loudly about social action but don't believe in the basics of the Christian faith actually do less because it's not fed by a living faith. So James says that faith without works is dead, but I can tell you that works without faith um, soon just shrivels up and, and fades away too. And, that, and that's a great theme in the book of Romans as well as of James. So if you want active listening, then listen to what God says about wealth. If he's given you some, he gave it to you so that you could help orphans and widows in their distress, not just so that you could line your own nest and, and live more prosperously. Now, having said all of that, you know, we've talked a lot about works. So is, is there any grace in James? Well, um, it's pretty hard to get through very, very much reading without finding another outpouring of grace in James. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. God gives generously to all without finding fault. You know, he doesn't say, oh, but you did this, and you did this, and you did this. Um, if you ask for wisdom, he's not going to nitpick. If you're really seeking wisdom from him, he gives it without finding fault. Every good and perfect gift, of that's what grace means, is a gift. Every gift comes from the Father of heavenly light. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. You didn't decide to get yourself born. You know, if, if you thought that James and Paul were just disagreeing and that it's really not grace at all in James, James is saying, hey, God chose. Okay, just, we read about election in Paul. God chose. You didn't choose, first of all, to get born. God chose to give you life. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, and that's where our life comes from. And so there, there's grace all right in James. Um, humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. It doesn't say you can save yourself. It's that word of God's promise through the power of the Holy Spirit that can save you. It's not the law that you slave away, and if you've slaved well enough, then you get saved. It's the perfect law that gives liberty. Um, and James says repeatedly, Speak and act graciously, you know, as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who hasn't been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You live by God's grace and you treat other people with grace. That's, that's the motto all through the book of James. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And how does the book end? You know, he's, he's laid into us on a few things throughout the book. You know, the way we use our tongue, um, the way that we get too cozy with the world, the way we get too much in love with riches and prosperity, and a whole host of other things that I've talked about. But then at the very end, he kind of clues us into what he's been doing as well as what he advises us to do. Um, if people wander from the truth, we'll bring them back. That's what James is about. Um, it's the grace of God to bring people back who've been wandering. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death, and cover over a multitude of sins. So James ends on that note of grace. Um, when somebody turns you back, um, a multitude of sins have been removed. And when you are able, by God's grace, to, to help someone else to change and to find God's grace and, and to listen and put into practice the word of God, um, you're, save, you're saving that person from death by God's grace. So... Um, I could go on, but if there's any question whether James is a book of grace, I, I trust that one's laid to rest. And um, active listening. Hear the word of God. It's the word of a gracious God, a God who says, listen to me that your soul may live. Um, listen carefully. And he's talking not just to make noise. Um, he's talking to change us, to give us life, and then to change the way that we live those lives, our attitudes, our tongues and talk, our actions, all of it, um, is transformed when we live in relationship with God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this wonderful book of James. We thank you that you gave these words through your own brother, and we know that um, even during your ministry, your brothers still didn't believe in you and at times thought that you were insane, and yet, by your grace, you took people who had lived in belief and, and transformed them. And, and James became known as James the Just, a mighty man of prayer and of wisdom and of holiness. And we pray, Lord, that some of us who've started out with wrong attitudes towards you and who've stumbled along through life, and sometimes it's almost the same thing. James was so familiar growing up in the same family, and some of us growing up with the things of God don't realize how precious they are, and, and familiarity almost breeds contempt. And so we pray for that life 
of Christ by his spirit to live in us and to renew us and to touch our lives and help us to walk with you. And we pray, Lord, that we will not be people who deceive ourselves. Where, where that is going on, we pray that your spirit will touch our hearts and also through the scriptures and, and through fellow believers, you will draw to our attention those things in our lives where we are fooling ourselves. We pray, Lord, that you'll keep us from willful sins, from doing the things we know are wrong, and we pray also that you will reveal to us our hidden faults and that the mirror of your word and the mirror of your people holding up that word to us will indeed um, cause us to heed a life-giving rebuke and be at home among the wise. We pray as we now come to your table, too, that these promises we've just heard of your wonderful grace, a grace that restores sinners, of a God who gives generously without finding fault, that that we will be refreshed and renewed by those good promises of grace again at the table today. For Jesus' sake, amen.